Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Inform Inform Start Malaysian Virtual Conference. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure to introduce our second panel speaker, Dr. Fatima Clinch Cousin. So Dr. Clinch Cousin is Frank and Helen Rich Faculty Development Chair and Associate Professor of Operational Research at Pepper School of Business, CMU. She holds a courtesy appointment at Department of Computer Science as well. And she completed her PhD at Georgia Tech in 2011. Her research interests are very broad and spread in many areas, basically on foundational theory and algorithms for convex automation and non-convex automation. And their applications in many, many different uh, aspects, for example, stochastic programming, machine learning, and business analytics. Dr. Clinch Cousin received many prestigious awards, including uh, NSF Creed, Creed Award, Informs Automation Society Prize for Young Researchers, and Informs Geophic Best Paper Award. So today her talk is on exactness in SDP relaxation of QCQP. At the end of the uh, talk, there will be 10 minutes Q&A section. Please feel free to type your questions and I will read these questions as much as I can. So now uh, let's, at the end of the section. And now let's welcome Dr. Clinch Cousin. Uh, without further ado, Fatima, now the floor is yours. Thank you, Beijun. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Um, I would like to also thank the organizers for creating these events to keep our community vibrant and uh, for, of course, this invitation to give a talk. Uh, today, I would like to talk about my recent work on the exactness in SDP relaxations of quadratically constrained quadratic programs. This is joint work with my uh, PhD student Alex Wang from CMU CS and CJ Argu from CMU Math. Um, well, this talk is going to be about uh, quadratically constrained quadratic programs. So naturally, these are based on quadratic functions. Here, uh, throughout the talk, I will represent them with a QIX, and uh, we will have X transpose AIX. Uh, the matrix AI here uh, is not required to be positive same definite. Therefore, the uh, underlying quadratic can be non-convex. In this class of optimization problems, we are uh, minimizing a quadratic function that I'm denoting with Q0x, subject to a domain defined by uh, quadratic functions or linear functions. Um, here's a pictorial depiction of uh, such a problem. I have uh, a number of non-convex quadratic constraints defining the domain. And in this case, I have a particular quadratic function for the objective. So uh, these problems appear in almost everywhere. They uh, appear in optimization, statistics, machine learning. Uh, classical examples include max cut and max click problem. Uh, they appear in control, in stability analysis of dynamical systems, in clustering, regression. Uh, in general, if you take any polynomial optimization problem, uh, you can add polynomially many new variables and new inequalities to ensure that it's uh, it becomes a quadratically constrained quadratic program. And similarly, if you have a mixed binary program, again, by introducing polynomially many new variables and constraints, you can convert it to a quadratic uh, program. So this is simply saying that QCQPs are a fundamental central class of uh, problems. Um, now, throughout the talk, uh, I will be working with different types of exactness guarantees, and uh, to that end, I will in fact be looking at an epigraphical representation of my problem. So uh, here I will be introducing a new variable t uh, and moving the objective function to the domain by using this new variable t. In this case, uh, my picture uh, becomes this non-convex region defined by the blue set here, and I will denote this uh, non-convex region. This is a region in X and T space. I will denote this region with the script E. Now, optimizing uh, a linear function over the script E set is the same thing as optimizing over the convex of the script E set, which is depicted in magenta in this picture. So, um, in general, QCQPs are non-convex and MP hard. Uh, because they include well-known AP hard problems like max cut. But uh, we have a very well-defined way of generating a relaxation for QCQP. And this goes through the standard uh, short semi-definite programming relaxation. 
Uh, here, uh, I am expanding my quadratic functions, defining the QCQP. Just a very quick overview of this relaxation is, uh, in the next step, I can rewrite uh, this problem by introducing a matrix variable Y, which is supposed to be equal to X, X transpose, this outer product of the X vector. Uh, with itself. And once we introduce this matrix variable, we see that our objective function and our quadratic constraints now become linear constraints in the new matrix variable y and our original vector x. Now, uh, this means we are still dealing with a non-convex problem because uh, the relation between the matrix y and the vector x is uh, a rank one relation that we need to enforce and that is a non-convex constraint. Uh, we obtained the relaxation of this problem by dropping that equality. And uh, if when we say that the matrix Y needs to dominate the matrix XX transpose in a positive semi-definite sense, then we immediately obtain the corresponding positive semi-definite relaxation for this problem. And uh, because we are uh, dropping a requirement, uh, this is indeed a relaxation. And we know that the optimum QCQP objective value will be uh, at least as uh, large as the optimum STP objective value. Um, well, this is a well-known relaxation. Uh, and since I'm looking at various uh, concepts of exactness, I would like to also look at the epigraph representation of this relaxation. And to do so, uh, again, we will introduce a variable T and move our objective function to the constraint. And um, now uh, I want to emphasize that while I was writing these optimization problems, I was always putting a there exists y uh, quantifier here. So indeed, I'm now interested in the projection of this STP relaxation. So uh, I will denote this script ESDP uh, for the projection of this STP region. So I will denote uh, the projection on the space of X and T variables. And therefore, this script ESTP set, it's the projection of a convex set, it will be a convex set in the X and T space, and it will live in the same space as the epigraph set of the QCQP. So uh, let me uh, go over a couple of facts here. Uh, Q QCQPs are highly expressible, expressive. Uh, I have already mentioned a number of areas they are used, but they are MP hard in general. And uh, we use SDP relaxation as an approximation for QCQPs. And the vast amount of literature talking about approximation guarantees for SDP relaxations of QCQPs under various assumptions. Famous examples include Max Scott or Nishor's Pyoto theorem. So um, this is all nice, but uh, sometimes we may want to use QCQP uh, for the purposes of exactness. And uh, if you want to uh, look for, for example, objective value exactness, uh, meaning that optimum QCQP value matches the optimum STP value, then this occurs when we have a sequence of rank one STP solutions converging to the optimum uh, value. Um, now, uh, it, may, it may not be possible uh, to check in polynomial time that this optimum objective value exactness occurs. In fact, uh, Monique Laurent and Poliak uh, has shown that through a reduction to partition problem, has shown that it's in general MP hard to check that objective value exactness occurs for QCQP. Uh, given this, uh, we are interested in sufficient conditions for exactness. And uh, in, in this talk, I will first look at uh, the convex exactness. And this is uh, happening when the convex cell of the ST, uh, QCQP epigraph is given by the projected STP set. So I'm interested in understanding what sufficient conditions guarantee such convex cell exactness. And uh, such convex cell exactness can be used uh, when we are uh, trying to convexify a part of our problem. Uh, and in particular special cases, uh, these sufficient conditions can be useful for that purpose. And um, a second way to look at exactness conditions from SDP uh, is based on the objective value exactness. And in the objective value exactness, instead of trying to match the convex hull of the epigraph exactly, we will simply say that how about the optimum objective values of these problems match? So this is simply saying that 
the points, the optimal points, being uh, having the same objective value. And in the last part of the talk, um, in the in the middle of the talk, I will talk about conditions, maybe sex sufficient conditions may be very difficult to guarantee in general, but we may be interested in given a particular point from the STP uh, feasible region, maybe we may want to simply check uh, whether that point is in the convex cell of the QCQP or not. Or if it's not in the convex cell, we may want to have a certificate that the SDP, projected SDP region is indeed strictly larger than the convex cell of the QCQP. Um, and in the very last part of the talk, uh, I will talk about sufficient conditions that ensure that for every choice of objective function, STP exactness happens. And we will see that uh, this is a much stronger notion of exactness. We are not just considering a single particular objective function, but every possible objective function. And we will see that uh, this stronger notion of exactness indeed imply convex cell exactness and objective value exactness as well. Um, so uh, I will look at these questions in three settings. And uh, the first setting is this epigraph uh, of the QCQ script E set. Uh, this lives in the X and T space. Um, in, in one part of the talk, I will also look at just a general quadratically constrained set. And uh, the difference here is I'm not assuming the existence of a special epigraph variable T. Uh, and I'm overloading notation a little bit because our results uh, will look very similar in both, both of these cases. And in the last part of the talk, I will be looking at uh, sets in a lifted space. So now you can think about um, looking at the sets that are living in the STP space. And these sets I, I will denote with script M. These are subsets of the positive semi-definite con obtained by adding homogeneous linear matrix inequalities. Uh, a family of linear matrix inequalities, and I will uh, show you how indeed these sets play a role for our exactness results. Um, so throughout the talk, I'm going to be emphasizing linear inequalities, but all of our results indeed extend uh, and cover the case when this, these sets are defined by uh, linear equations as well. So let me give you a very brief overview of the literature. Uh, again, this is just a very short summary of uh, what's going on, but I want to tell you uh, where we started from. So um, the well-known result, maybe the first result that comes to mind when we talk about HTTP exactness is the case of s uh, This is uh, the case of optimizing a quadratic uh, function over a single quadratic constraint. In such a case, uh, the well-known result S lemma by Jakubowicz states that uh, the STP uh, relaxation of such a QCQP is exact. And more recently, Alex and I, we looked at uh, the case, this particular case, and showed that, uh, again, we will have convex cell exactness as well. Uh, one thing to note is, uh, in this case, uh, nothing other than um, a primal feasibility is needed to establish STP exactness. The next line of work for HTTP exactness focuses on specific uh, QCQPs. In particular, these are diagonal QCQPs where all of the matrices participating in the quadratic program are diagonal mat matrices. Uh, in this line of work, uh, Bantal and Hartog, for example, has a nice uh, but a second order corner formulation of these problems, and they have uh, exactness characterizations for them. Um, in a more recent work, Sambiru Rani in UEA looked at again general conditions for diagonal QCQPs. These are sufficient conditions guaranteeing STP exactness, and uh, they have uh, conditions that can be checked uh, in practice. Uh, again, Locatelli uh, has studied STP exactness for diagonal QCQPs uh, through the KKT conditions. So uh, in another line of work, STP exactness uh, pops up. And this is a line of work uh, mainly developed by Amir Beck. And in this line of work, uh, we are looking at quadratic matrix programs. So the main thing in quadratic matrix programs is we have a matrix variable, X lives in the space of R and times K. And uh, our constraints are quadratic constraints in terms of our matrix variable. And this uh, structure appears in robust least squares. 
or is the result of uh, Bureau Montero reformulations for rank constraint STP. So this is indeed uh, not a rare problem either. And uh, for this line of work, uh, Amir Beck has conditions that relates uh, the rank of this matrix K uh, to the number of inequalities and uh, talks about when objective value exactness happens. And finally, in the concept uh, in the context of trust region subproblem and its variance, uh, there are various results establishing that certain strengthened STP uh, reformulations of these quadratic programs uh, are exact. And uh, I'm listing only a few of these references here. Sam Mirror had a very nice survey on this topic uh, relatively recently. So um, let me give you an outline of what I will talk about today. Uh, today, we will see that um, we will first examine some geometric properties of the projected STP set. And in particular, we will see that uh, the set of convex Lagrange multipliers will play a key role in developing exactness results. And we will also uh, see that the quadratic eigenvalue multiplicity, which is a concept that we defined, but it uh, captures the amount of symmetry that's inherent in your uh, QCQP and thus inherent in your STP, will play a, a big role in defining uh, the exactness, sufficient conditions for exactness. Um, and then uh, here is a um, here is a like highlight of the type of result that we will see. Uh, for the epigraphical sets, we will see that if the quadratic forms interact nicely, and this nice interaction will be captured by the convex Lagrange multiplier geometry, and if each quadratic has large amount of symmetry, then the convex exactness holds, and convex exactness will also imply objective value exactness. And uh, for the cases where this nice uh, Lagrange multiplier geometry is not present, uh, we will see that uh, given a point x from the projected STP set, we can uh, have a finite time rounding procedure that certifies either the point x is indeed in the convex of the QCQP set by providing an explicit convex decomposition of the point, uh, or it will say that indeed uh, the projected STP set is much larger uh, than the convex hull of the uh, QCQP set. And finally, uh, in the last part, I will be talking about spectral sets and uh, introducing a concept of rank one generatedness for these sets. And we will see that um, rank one generatedness indeed imply uh, the convex hull exactness and its objective value exactness notions in the uh, lower dimensional space. And in fact, uh, in the case of uh, two linear matrix inequalities, we will see that the sufficient conditions we present for rank one generatedness property are also necessary. So uh, let's start with STP relaxations and these uh, convex Lagrange multipliers. Well, here I have uh, written down our quadratic program. And uh, based on these quadratic constraints, um, I, I would like to explain that um, the STP relaxation is doing nothing but a, a very meaningful aggregation to generate new constraints that are valid for our convex cell. So given these uh, quadratic constraints, if our goal is to generate a valid quadratic constraint uh, on the uh, a lower bound on, on the T variable, epigraph variable, then the most natural thing that we will do is associate every one of these constraints with a Lagrange multiplier, let's call that uh, gamma, and these multipliers should be non-negative and obtain a constraint by aggregation. So we will uh, define this quadratic function Q gamma X, and uh, this is simply an aggregation of these functions. And by nature of this aggregation, uh, we know that for every XT in our script E set, for every XT in our epigraph set, and every gamma that's non-negative, this new quadratic function will give a valid inequality. Here I picked a particular gamma and uh, the green uh, area is depicted as the new quadratic constraint that's generated from that gamma. Now, one thing to note is uh, this 
construction is giving us relative inequalities for only uh, script E set, and script E set was by definition non-convex. In particular, through this construction, we can obtain non-convex quadratic inequalities as well. Now, this can be troublesome if you are trying to build a relaxation that's convex and therefore easier to optimize. So in particular, uh, we may say that given this quadratic function that we are building, uh, I would rather have this quadratic to be a convex quadratic so I can easily use it in optimization. And in order to do that, uh, the main thing we need to ensure is this matrix that we have created uh, with the dual multipliers should be a positive indefinite matrix. So we can say that let's look at all the quadratic forms that we can obtain through aggregation such that they are convex. So this will be exactly the capital gamma set here, such that gammas are non-negative vectors and Q gamma X is a convex function, which is the same thing as saying that all non-negative gamma vectors such that this uh, aggregation matrix A0 plus sum of gamma I alpha I's, AIs is a positive semi-definite matrix. Okay, so, uh, well, then uh, we will have the guarantee that for every gamma, uh, coming from this capital gamma set. And for any point that's in the convex hull of the QCQP epigraph, the new constraint Q gamma X less than or equal to T is not only a valid constraint for the script E, but also a valid constraint for the convex hull of script E because it's a convex constraint. So again, you know, uh, by changing gamma, we can generate different convex uh, constraints like this. Um, so what's more interesting is that this is indeed under primal feasibility and dual strict feasibility. This is indeed exactly what uh, the projected STP epigraph set. So the projected STP epigraph set can be written as the points XT such that uh, they are feasible with respect to every single convex aggregation constraint that we can generate from our original QCQP. So this is a very nice, neat characterization of the projected SDP uh, set. And uh, because of this characterization, we can in fact uh, write our optimum SDP value uh, in this particular form as well. Um, now here we have a characterization of gamma set immediately as well, and it's given by our original data. Uh, in this particular case, I'm depicting this gamma set uh, is a polyhedral set here, and this is our uh, projected STP set. And uh, this characterization is simply saying that take uh, look at all the gamma values from capital gamma set and look at all the uh, convex quadratic constraints coming from the corresponding gamma uh, vector and intersect these to obtain your STP uh, epigraphs, projected STP set. Um, now, in this particular case, if gamma is polyhedral, then uh, you only need to worry about the extreme points and extreme rays of uh, gamma in order to generate your projected uh, STP epigraph set. Uh, in general, this gamma set uh, given in this form uh, may not be polyhedral. In fact, it may not be bounded either. So um, although I depicted in this form, there is no reason for us to believe this gamma set will be polyhedral or bounded. Uh, and in fact, uh, given is written as a spectra, this gamma set, uh, it will be empty hard to check whether this gamma set is polyhedral or not. However, uh, there are some special cases uh, when this gamma set is polyhedral, in particular when the AI matrices participating are all simultaneously diagonalizable, then the resulting gamma set will be polyhedral. And if it happens that this gamma set is polyhedral, then uh, the projected STP set is indeed defined by finitely many convex quadratic constraints, meaning that the projected STP set is a second order con representable set in such a case. Now, uh, let's talk about our second ingredient for establishing sufficient conditions. And this is uh, the symmetry that's uh, present in the quadratic form. So uh, we define this concept of quadratic eigenvalue multiplicity. And this is the largest integer k, and k uh, will always be at least one, such that 
each matrix in, in our quadratic function uh, has the following block form. So we are uh, looking at each AI matrix being the Kronecker curve product of K by K, K by K identity matrix with a smaller uh, matrix AI. So the smaller matrix AI is being repeated. Um, now uh, we will see that under such um, symmetry in the QCQP and thus in the SCP, uh, we can give uh, guarantees sufficient conditions for exactness. Well, uh, a, a very classical example where such a symmetry appears is uh, the vectorized uh, QCQP reformulations of quadratic matrix programs. Uh, these are uh, these quadratic matrix programs uh, work with constraints uh, of this form. And in fact, uh, for these matrices X in N times K, you can reformulate uh, the corresponding problem by uh, creating a long vector X, uh, small x, that lives in N times K space. And uh, when you do that reformulation of expanding the matrix X into a vector, uh, you will indeed uh, build in such a symmetry uh, in your quadratic program. So uh, let me give you a glimpse of our results for the epigraph sets. And uh, I will state these results as a corollary. We have uh, more general results in the paper, but I wanted to have something more uh, easier to explain here. So uh, we are supposing primal feasibility and dual strict feasibility. And these are um, very common assumptions in this line of work to guarantee that uh, STP strong duality happens. In such a case, if the Lagrange multipliers that we work with, this gamma set is polyhedral, and if we have sufficiently large symmetry, this K is our quadratic eigenvalue multiplicity, if we have sufficiently large symmetry, then we have convex solar exactness and we have objective value exactness. So let's take a look at what we mean by sufficiently large symmetry. So the symmetry that we are seeking uh, should be the minimum of the number of constraints that we have and uh, the number of non-zero linear components of our quadratics, these BIs were the linear components of our quadratics plus one. So um, under this case, we have both uh, convex value exactness and objective value exactness. Uh, let me walk through a couple of special cases for this corollary and let's uh, try to understand what the corollary means in these special cases. So uh, when we have a single quadratic constraint, this is the case of S lemma, uh, then this M will be equal to one. So this minimum will be equal to one. And uh, we, we have already seen that the amount of symmetry is always at least one. So this constraint will be automatically satisfied. And when we have a single quadratic constraint, indeed, uh, you can easily see that this dual multiplier set uh, will be in R, and therefore it will always be a line segment and it will always be polyhedral. So in the case of a single constraint, uh, this result is already saying that uh, we will have convex exactness and STP exactness um, for uh, S lemma and generalized stress region problem. Um, maybe a more interesting case is what happens if we are dealing with homogeneous quadratics with no linear components, and here all the BIs are equal to zero. In such a case, if uh, the AI matrices are also diagonal, then uh, the gamma set will be polyhedral because of diagonal AI matrices. And this minimum again will be equal to one. Therefore, we will be saying that if you are dealing with homogeneous quadratics, such that uh, the AIs are diagonal as well, uh, identif identifying their common uh, solution or feasibility of such system can be done via SDP relaxation. Now, this recovers partially uh, a result by Barbinock, which uh, Barbinock's results say that if the number of quadratics that you have is fixed, and uh, if you are looking at, uh, again, the feasibility of a system of homogeneous quadratics, that can be done by a special algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm. Now, uh, our result is only covering this partially because we are assuming that the AIs are diagonal. And Barbinov does not assume that. 
Um, let's look at a different example. And suppose that in this example, AIs are not only diagonal, but they are also uh, a multiple of the identity matrix. In such a case, indeed, uh, this symmetry uh, multiplier, this K, is uh, very large. It will be equal to N. And in, in that particular case, if the number of constraints that we have is smaller than the dimension, uh, then uh, we will again have convex land SDP exactness. And this is uh, a case that, that's referred to Swiss cheese by some before. So uh, it was easier to visualize this. So I have a figure here. Uh, this particular case will say that uh, if your AI matrices are multiples of the identity matrix, uh, your constraints will look like uh, inside, stay inside the ball constraints or stay outside of the ball constraints or a bunch of linear constraints where you can say uh, zero times identity is your um, AI matrix for those. And uh, in this case, our result will say that uh, if this set is non-empty and if the dimension n is larger than the number of constraints you have, then the standard SDP relaxation is tight for the QCQP. So um, to summarize, for the epigraphical set, the sets, we looked at when the SDP relaxation is exact, and uh, we analyzed these dual Lagrange multipliers, gamma, and the amount of symmetry, uh, k, uh, to, to have a summary of these is us here. So in the case when gamma is polyhedral, we have the convex exactness when uh, this amount of symmetry is larger than this quantity here. And uh, that also implies objective value exactness. Now, uh, we have a different proof technique that works with general gamma sets. And using that proof technique, we were able to show that when the amount of symmetry is much larger in uh, contrast to the polyhedral case, we can again show convex exactness and objective value exactness. I want to highlight that uh, the difference between polyhedral and general gamma result uh, is significant. Uh, this minimum can be very useful, as we have seen in the previous examples. In certain cases, these linear components being zero can uh, allow us work with even a smaller uh, symmetry present in the problem in the polyhedral case. Unfortunately, our results for the general gamma weren't able to take use uh, make use of such a uh, um, such problem-based data. Um, in addition, uh, we have also showed uh, a sufficient condition for objective value exactness. And this sufficient condition works with the faces of the uh, gamma set and uh, how the linear, again, the linear components of the quadratics behave uh, on the faces of that gamma set and uh, their projections on the common uh, zero eigenspace of the AI matrices on those faces. Well, maybe uh, something to note here is, uh, although this condition looks a little cryptic, uh, we, we were also able to show that this condition implies uh, the most general condition uh, we know at the time from Sam and Inu's paper uh, on the case of uh, diagonal QCQPs. So uh, these results also led to many more questions. In particular, this assumption on polyhedral gamma uh, is very restrictive. Um, so it prevents us handle, handling rather simple sets, trying to model big M relations, for example. And uh, in general, we were wondering whether uh, the case of general gamma is really fundamentally different than the case of polyhedral gamma or not. So in the second part, uh, instead of looking at just uh, STP exactness guarantees and sufficient conditions for that, uh, we started looking at uh, these quadratic constraint sets and trying to understand when we can guarantee whether a point is in this quadratically constrained set or not. So again, I'm using this notation script E, although in this particular case, I don't have the epigraph structure anymore, and I, I just have a number of quadratic constraints. Now, we can define the corresponding projected STP set uh, analogously, um, and, and we can look at the corresponding Lagrange multipliers. So one thing to note here is because I no longer uh, separate out an objective function uh, in my script E set, now my gamma multipliers become a cone. 
it's a subset of the non-negative orthant uh, satisfying a linear matrix inequality. And here I'm depicting that con as uh, gamma here. And in addition, we will see that the geometry of gamma and its polar, gamma polar here, plays a role. So uh, gamma polar is a set of all vectors that have non-positive inner product with every vector from gamma. Um, well, we will start by again rewriting our STP relaxation. And uh, to do that, to save from notation, I will define a map Q that will take a vector X in Rn, and it will map uh, to a vector in Rm. So we will be looking at uh, the corresponding function value of every quadratic, and that will, that will be our vector Qx. Now, using this notation, uh, we will see that again under those strict feasibility, the STP epigraph set, sorry, the STP set is nothing but the set of all vectors x such that they have a um, non negative inner product with every vector gamma from the capital gamma set. And this is exactly uh, this. Um, this is exactly the same uh, line of reasoning that we've seen before based on aggregation to generate valid quadratic constraints. In this particular case, we are generating valid convex quadratic constraints. But uh, using our notation, this is equivalent to saying that uh, the STP, STP set is nothing but the set of vectors x such that the QX vector uh, is lying in the gamma polar set. So uh, I want to highlight that although this gamma polar set is a convex set and we have an explicit description of it, this QX map is indeed a nonlinear and non-convex map. So uh, this description is possibly not very useful for computational purposes, but it was useful for us to understand uh, this question of whether a point, a given point, is in the uh, convex all of the QCQP set or not. So um, I'm, I'm, I don't have enough time to get into the details of this line of work, uh, but what we did was uh, identifying a set of directions uh, that we refer as rounding directions such that uh, when you move along uh, these directions, starting the given point x, when you move a little along uh, the direction y and minus y, you still remain in the set, uh, in the STP set. And in particular, if these rounding directions uh, at the point is non-trivial, then you're also guaranteed that you are moving under uh, a minimal assumption. You are also guaranteed that you are moving uh, also in the convex cell of the QCQP set. So uh, the critical thing uh, or the interesting thing in this line of work is uh, we were able to give this description of the rounding directions explicitly in terms of the point X that we are examining and the data of the problem, like AIs and BIs and so on. And uh, this description is indeed given by a set of linear inequalities. It's a non-trivial description. It's not something that you would want to work every day, but it's something if you need to, you can process. Now, based on uh, such a description, uh, under, again, those strict feasibility assumption and under a much more relaxed assumption uh, saying that the gamma polar is spatially exposed, we were able to give a finite time rounding procedure. So what this rounding procedure guarantees is it takes as input a point from the uh, projected STP set and uh, it either outputs a convex decomposition of the point certifying that that point is in the convex hull of the QCQP set, or uh, it certifies that the convex hull of the QCQP set is indeed strictly smaller than the uh, projected STP set by identifying a point in the projected STP set, but not in the QCQP set, such that the rounding directions at the point is just a trivial uh, vector zero. Now, um, the results that we have in the polyhedral case uh, were, we realized that the results we had in the polyhedral case were implicitly doing this procedure and we are sufficient conditions for guaranteeing that uh, the corresponding rounding directions are always non-trivial. Uh, but we were doing this in a much simpler setting where gamma was polyhedral, therefore gamma polar was also polyhedral and facially exposed. 
uh, in in this recent work, uh, we were able to say uh, I identify this property of being facially exposed uh, as the critical uh, condition that allows us to do such a rounding procedure, and um, so this uh, I believe is a very significant development in terms of uh, the sufficient conditions as well. So using this procedure, uh, what we can do? Well, we are able to show, for example, convex hull exactness of STP uh, in various cases. This allows us to recover the well-known perspective reformulation trick used in simple began formulations. Um, and uh, it also allows us to process, again, quadratic, mat quadratic matrix programs uh, and show that convex hull exactness happens for them when, uh, again, K, the symmetry is sufficiently large. Uh, in general, we are hoping that this procedure will allow us uh, to develop more convex hull exactness and objective value exactness results. And uh, we are also hoping that this procedure can be part of a uh, competition. Uh, in particular, if we are trying to develop a branch unbound strategy uh, based on the CP relaxations, we are hoping that this procedure can be useful. So um, in the last part of my talk, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in the lifted space as opposed to the uh, original space. Now I will be talking about the lifted space uh, of positive same definite matrices. And I will be talking about this set script M. And this set is subset of the positive same definite con obtained by adding a family of homogeneous linear matrix inequalities. Um, so for these type of sets, I will be interested in the property uh, that I refer as rank one generated. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you have heard this before, but in case you haven't, a closed convex con S, that subset of the positive same, same definite con is called rank one generated. If all of its extreme rays are generated by rank one matrices. So uh, the, our main question here is given such a family of matrices, metric matrices, when will the set S script S be rank one generated? Um, now, why do I care about such a set? Uh, again, very quickly, if I go over uh, the STP relaxation, how it was built, um, I'm now using Y as my original uh, variables participating in quadratic forms, and I have the corresponding quadratic program here. Uh, we can take such a quadratic program and add a single variable and write every one of our quadratic functions uh, in the lifted space as homogeneous quadratic functions. And now we will have this additional uh, constraint saying that the new variable x1 square is equal to 1. Um, now, in this representation, again, we can build the corresponding equivalent representation that will allow us to switch to the STP relaxation. And the moment when we switch to the STP relaxation, we will see that uh, our feasible domain is nothing but a set of the form S, script S, intersected with a single uh, inhomogeneous uh, linear matrix equation. Okay, so uh, what this is saying is if I take any QCQP, I can write it in a lifted space by adding one more uh, variable where all the QC, all the quadratic functions are homogeneous. And then my STP relaxation uh, will be uh, given as the cone, that cone structure that I'm interested in, uh, intersected with an affine equality, affine plane. So, uh, well, why do we care about this rank one generated property in this setting? Uh, to begin with, rank one generated property uh, ensures that some STP objective value exactness. In fact, uh, this script S set is rank one generated if and only for every uh, objective function M0 that we optimize over the homogeneous uh, constraint system, we have the STP objective value exactness. And in fact, uh, if you think about the QCQP relaxation uh, that we built, then we know that we are also interested in the case where we have an affine equation here. And in such a case, uh, if the script S is rank one generated, then for every uh, objective function such that the STP optimum value is bounded below, uh, we again have the corresponding objective value exactness of the STP. Moreover, 
uh, we can show that rank one generated property of the script S set imply convex all descriptions via the project SBP set. Again, if we start uh, with a rank one generated script S set under do strict feasibility, uh, we can establish uh, that projected SDP domain gives the convex hull of the QCQP set. Uh, and if you have an epigraph variable, again, uh, we can handle those uh, through the projected SDP epigraph set as well. So uh, to summarize, um, rank one generated property under minor assumptions imply both SDP objective value exactness and convex hull characterizations. So you can think about this as a different way to approach exactness properties without uh, relying on specific symmetry that's present in the problem that we have seen from the previous results. So, um, then this property naturally captures when the sum of Scarce hierarchy converges in exactly one step. And in fact, this property can be viewed as something that's analogous to uh, LP relaxations of integer linear programs. So, um, there are very well known properties that guarantee that uh, the system of linear inequalities that we have result in an integral polyedra. And you may ask, uh, when is a system of quadratic constraints will result in the analogous rank one uh, generated property? And uh, this is exactly uh, in the same line of thought. So uh, this property appears in the literature in various forms. Uh, again, Islam is uh, a particular example. Positive semi-definite matrix completion is another example. Uh, although this terminology was not used uh, in trust vision problem and its variance, uh, all the results that I know uh, are developed specifically for this rank one generated property. That's the way the proofs worked out. And this property has uh, recently been studied in real algebraic geometry, trying to understand how the varieties behave and uh, what type of uh, rank one rank of the solutions we have in the corresponding SDP relaxations. So in contrast to all this line of work, here we are interested, in, instead of looking at particular classes of problems, we are interested in uh, given such a family of linear matrix inequalities, given the properties of these inequalities, when we can have the rank one generated property. So, um, this is exactly stating that given a set of a family of uh, matrices M, uh, we are interested in when this set S is rank one generated. We want to know sufficient conditions or maybe uh, necessary conditions that guarantee this property. Uh, we will quickly see that uh, the set P that's obtained by setting these inequalities into equations is easier to process. And uh, in fact, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, even if we start from such an inequality system, we can lift it in, in a lifted space to obtain a system of equations. But unfortunately, such a lifting does not preserve rank one generated properties. So uh, we have to treat the systems of inequalities and equations separately uh, in terms of this property. Um, we have a number of uh, we have examined the facial structure of these sets, and we have a number of results that you can view as analogous to the results that you will expect in the case of integer uh, polyedra, for example. And uh, using these results, uh, we can we started processing or developing sufficient conditions. Uh, for example, one of these results say that if you have a single matrix, then the corresponding S set uh, is rank one generated if and only if the T set is rank one generated. And uh, in the case of single matrix, this S set is always rank one generated. This is based on S lemma or Dean's theorem. And uh, using this, uh, we thought of a case where we will also always have rank one generated property. And it's the case where the inequalities that are uh, added to the semi-definite cone are not interacting inside uh, the positive semi-definite cone. We refer this case as a non-interacting linear matrix inequality situation. And uh, in fact, uh, given a class of matrices, uh, the case of non-interacting uh, linear LMIs happen uh, when, uh, the, when every pair uh, are such that they do not have a combination 
a linear combination that's in the positive semidefinite cone and that's non-trivial. So uh, through this lemma, we are able to identify when a family of linear matrix inequalities are non-interacting, and when we have non-interacting linear matrix inequalities, we have the corresponding rank one generated property. Um, of course, the case of interacting linear matrix inequalities is more interesting. And in the case of uh, two inequalities, uh, we know that this S set will be rank one generated if and only if the associated T set is rank one generated. So um, coming back, we developed uh, a system that relates rank one generated this property uh, to the solutions of quadratic systems. So uh, we can say that a cone is rank one generated if and only if a particular condition related to the quadratics is satisfied, that can be checked. And uh, Using that uh, condition, we were able to find a further restriction saying that if another sufficient condition is satisfied, we will have rank one generated property. And this particular sufficient condition relates back uh, when a particular variety um, is intersecting the range of uh, the matrices. And uh, this variety. Uh, whenever this variety contains a homogeneous hyperplane, then we will automatically say that uh, both the S sets and the T sets are rank one generated. So um, then this question boiled down to understanding when this variety contains a homogeneous hyperplane and in a specific uh, case, when we are talking about a single matrix, we can uh, have an exact characterization of when the variety contains a, a homogeneous hyperplane. And in such a case, uh, this is simply saying that uh, the single matrix M should be a very specific indefinite rank two matrix. So uh, to summarize using these, uh, we were able to look at uh, a family of matrices that are parameterized uh, rank two indefinite matrices. And for those family, for that family of matrices, we were able to say that the T sets and the S sets associated with it are always rank one generated. So one can say this looks very specific. I don't know why I would see rank one, uh, sorry, rank two indefinite matrices of this form, but uh, they're indeed interesting because you can view this exactly as uh, adding a conic constraint to the same definite program, uh, a conic constraint of this form. Uh, X times A is in a cone K, and cone K here can be any closed convex cone. So our results then imply that uh, a set of this form is always in quantum generated. And in fact, sets of these forms are not that rare. Uh, if we, for example, look at uh, the second order cone RLT relaxation uh, of uh, the trust region subproblem and its variance, uh, we are, they are obtained exactly uh, by constraints of this form. So uh, with a little more work of uh, using our results, we were able to again recover this well-known result from the literature. So um, to summarize everything, at least in the case of two elements, we have two classes of sufficient conditions. And uh, here I have written them explicitly. So the first sufficient condition says that the two LMIs defined by M1 and M2 do not interact. Uh, inside the positive semi-definite cone, and therefore we have the rank one generated property. And the second sufficient condition states that if the matrices M1 and M2 have a particular uh, rank two indefinite structure, then again we have the rank one generated property. So uh, with quite a non-trivial analysis, we were able to show that these are not only sufficient, but also necessary. So this was surprising to me. Um, I, I thought these conditions were rather restrictive. It was surprising to see that they're also necessary in the case of two LMIs. Well, um, this is also uh, just to contrast uh, the case, the only other case that's known before this was the case of a single LMI, and that was the S lemma result. So um, in the S lemma result, if you just Add a single LMI to push the semi-definite cone, then you're always rank one generated. In the case of two LMIs, uh, we are really talking about the very, very, very particular structures that uh, are necessary and sufficient for the rank one generated property. So uh, to wrap up, uh, our results in the original space utilize the geometry of the 
projected SDP graph set, in particular the dual multipliers gamma and gamma polar uh, and their facial structure uh, played a big role. Uh, we have seen that the amount of symmetry in the QCQP uh, again determines whether we can have sufficient conditions. And uh, we have identified these rounding directions uh, and we can use that rounding direction uh, to generate a to, in a finite time procedure that certifies either a point from the SPP set is in the convex hull of the QCQP set or it will determine that uh, the STP set is indeed strictly larger than the QCQP set. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, relying on such a procedure will be critical in a number of future work as well, where uh, anyone who wants to see if their convex cell for a uh, nonlinear system is given by the STP or not. Uh, in the case of spectral sets, uh, they have identified the strength line generated property as a critical condition for uh, establishing uh, STP exactness results. And I have I didn't mention many results from the paper, but we have a strength line generated two step uh, identifying conditions, sufficient conditions, and properties and a few operations that preserve strength line generated. I'm hoping that this line of work again will be very useful to understand one STP acceptance structure. So uh, I'd like to thank you again for uh, joining the talk and listening to the talk. Uh, if you would like to read more about this, these are the main references of the results that I mentioned in today's talk. And I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, Batman, this is a very interesting talk and very impressive. So many, so many uh, wonderful results. So I have, uh, you know, for our audience, there's a couple questions. So the first question is uh, uh, for, so in the first part of the talk, we saw that uh, knowing whether the, first, the set gamma for the Lagrange multipliers is polyhedron is important. So how can we check it? We know cases like simultaneous diagonalizable matrices results in it. Do we have general necessary and sufficient conditions? Um, thank you. I think that's a very good question. So let me uh, see. Well, this gamma set in, in general is defined as a spectrohedron uh, by linear matrix inequalities, and that already indicates something difficult may be happening. Um, for example, this gamma set is defined by a linear matrix inequality. And in fact, uh, it's MP hard to check whether a given spectrohedron is a polyhedron or not. This is a known result by Ramana. So if you are given general matrices AI, and if you don't have a diagonal structure, or if you don't believe it will be simultaneously diagonalizable, then this is going to be a difficult task. So there's another question that when gamma is not polyhedral, can one come up with good polyhedral approximation in polynomial time? Um, that's again a wonderful question. So again, I'm gonna come back to this uh, representation. And uh, if this representation, if uh, these constraints were not polyhedral, but say they were second order co-representable, so if this set here was a second order co-representable problem, then one can use uh, the bantal nimrovsky approximation to second order con to come up with a polyhedral approximation of this set. But uh, when we are talking about a spectrum, then there are well-known results that recently established that you cannot hope to have a fast polyhedral approximation to a general uh, spectrum. I see. Interesting. So, so I also had another question. So from myself. So, so we know the amount of a symmetry, the k, uh, the parameter k is a very important parameter. So, can mm -hmm. you can you il illustrate more so why this parameter is essentially very helpful to establish the existence of SDP? Um, sure. So let me go back maybe a few more slides. Um, So um, 
Although I stated this as a corollary and uh, I gave this result in this form, what happens is uh, in, in our analysis, we look at this uh, gamma object, the set of the Lagrange multipliers, and we look at uh, the phase of gamma uh, that SDP optimum is happening. And then uh, we look at how much freedom we have on that phase. So implicitly, we are doing a rounding procedure. And uh, this rounding, what happens is uh, like you, you want to pick a direction, uh, you are at this point X and you want to pick a direction that you can move and still remain in the convex cell. So um, the way that you want to pick that direction is going to use the uh, zero common zero eigenspace of the AI matrices. And uh, you would like to relate it back to the linear forms as well so that your uh, functions, you don't violate your constraints or the objective function behavior. And uh, if you remain on the common zero eigenspace, then, uh, you know, keeping a control on the quadratic part uh, will be easy. And if you have a bunch of zeros in terms of linear forms, then that value is not going to change when you do the rounding. So uh, in fact, this result is an interplay between uh, how much freedom we have in the common zero eigenspace. So instead of K, you can think about this. I actually have a condition here relating to common zero eigenspace. And uh, on this side, I, I keep these BI vectors. Um, and when we have the amount of symmetry large, uh, you can show that uh, the common zero eigenspace is also large. And that is how uh, this eigenvalue symmetry is playing a role. I see. Thank you. So, thank you. Okay, so I think uh, uh, there's no more question here. So, thank you, uh, Fatima. Thank you for, sure. for, for mm -hmm. your talk. It's really interesting. Thank you. Okay. Um, I see one question uh, asking, how did I plot the, uh, oh, these yeah. functions <laughs> and the graphs? And uh, they are plotted in Mathematica. And I should thank Alex, uh, Alex Wang for creating all these wonderful features.